the United States Antarctic Program for the International Geophysical Year 1957 and 1958, Task Force 43 was charged with the establishment and logistic support of scientific research stations on the frozen continent of Antarctica. Early in the year 1955, at the Navy's Construction Battalion Center at Davisville, Rhode Island, a special mobile construction battalion was established to accomplish the construction, maintenance, and operation of these scientific outposts. An all-nav request was sent to the fleet asking for volunteers for this project, and men reported into Davisville by the score. Surveyor construction drivers, and utility men, builders and electricians, steel workers, and construction mechanics. A rugged physical fitness program was put into effect to condition these men for the task that would follow. In addition to the physical training, the CBs were further indoctrinated by constant exercises in the construction and operation of the equipment that they would be using in the ice-locked continent. While the men were being conditioned for the Antarctic's test, tons of supplies were pouring into the Davisville depot. Before the stores were loaded aboard the cargo ships, they were color-coded according to their destination. This would simplify the task of offloading when the ships arrived at Antarctica. When ready for sea, the stores were taken aboard the Navy's attack transports, Arneb and Wyandotte, the USNS Greenville Victory. The tractor, workhorse of the CBs, is hoisted aboard, along with fuel oils, the lifeblood of the Antarctic, and runners for the 20-ton bobsled cargo haulers. With men berthed and cargo stowed, the ships of Task Force 43 head southward to the white continent at the bottom of the world. The main objectives that were to be accomplished during the first year at Antarctica were the establishment of a naval base at Little America on the coast of the eastern Ross Sea and the construction of a naval air facility in the vicinity of McMurdo Sound. Both these bases were to be utilized as logistic support stations for future outposts scheduled for construction during the following years. The station at Little America would support Bird Station by tractor train, and the naval air facility at McMurdo would support air operations for the establishment of the Amundsen Scott Station at the geographic South Pole. On 30 December 1955, the Arneb and the Greenville Victory moored to the bay ice in the vicinity of the proposed site for Little America. Offloading of cargo commenced immediately. Handling of the cargo was an all-hands evolution, 24 hours a day. Over 5,000 tons of supplies came ashore. Maneuvering the offloaded cargo alongside the ship was a dangerous and unpredictable job. Since the bay ice was treacherous, a lighter tractor was needed to move the supplies away from the sides of the ship. The small, low ground and pressure tractor proved its capabilities in this respect. The site for Little America 5 lay seven miles from the offloading point. Heavy tractors with bulldozer blades went to work compacting the soft snow along the supply route in preparation for the tractor trains that would follow. Where crevasses were encountered, the tractors filled and packed. Bridges were built to span the tidal cracks. When the trail was ready to receive the weight of the heavy tractor trains, the cargo was moved out. These 20-ton bobsleds with their 12 by 24-foot steel beds demonstrated their durability and effectiveness during the tractor train operation. Her cargo offloaded, the Greenville Victory departed for McMurdo Sound, leaving the Arneb to support the personnel until the new base was self-sufficient. 
The shelf ice at the base site was estimated to be 800 feet thick. The first step to be taken in construction was to establish a firm base for the building foundations. Ten-ton rollers compacted the loose snow, providing a firm, level surface on which to work. The basic foundation for the Antarctic building was the snow pad. Resembling short railroad ties, these stocky wooden timbers distribute the building's weight across a greater area of snow. The sills were attached to the snow pads to provide a strong back on which the steel trusses could seat themselves. The sills would also raise the building a sufficient distance from the snow surface to allow adequate air space underneath the structure. Next, steel floor trusses were seated upon the snow sills using four-foot centers. Floor panels were slid into place and locked together with metal clips. Walls were erected next using the same clip to secure the panels together. Painted a bright international orange, these panels are of the sandwich type. A thin aluminum interior facing acts as a fire deterrent and vapor barrier, while the spun glass insulation is protected by an exterior sheathing of plywood. The men were divided into two crews, each crew working a 12-hour shift. As soon as the shell of a building was completed and the electricians and utility men had installed the heating unit, the men began sleeping at the base site rather than making the return trek to the Arnep. One of the most important public utilities is the city water supply. The raw material is snow and lots of it. 2,300 gallons of water per day were used once the base began operating on a full-scale basis. Three snow melters, such as this one, were capable of meeting this demand. 30 kilowatt, three-phase diesel electric generators were used to supply power to the base. These generators were driven by the D315 diesel engine. Diesel fuel was an indispensable commodity in the Antarctic. It provided power for the camp vehicle, heat for the snow melter, and electric current for the 101 pieces of gear necessary to sustain life in this frozen wilderness. April 1956 saw the completion of Little America 5. Included in the 16 buildings comprising the base were a garage for the repair of the base vehicle various shops. And the powerhouse. In addition to the conventional panel type deep freeze structure, there was a need for specialized buildings to house scientific equipment. Resembling a gigantic peeled orange, this Rawin dome was assembled from prefabricated curved sections. Inside it contained special equipment used for recording weather conditions. Another building, unusual in its dimensions, was the Aurora Airglow Tower, specifically designed for the observation of astronomical phenomena. Simultaneously with the establishment of Little America 5, the Navy had broken ice at McMurdo Sound. 18 December 1955 saw the Icebreaker Glacier discharge an advance party for the purpose of locating an immediate landing strip and to investigate the feasibility of establishing Hut Point as a site for base construction. Hut Point was so named because of the presence of a perfectly preserved hut that Scott had erected in 1902. Although manufactured over half a century ago, the labels on these canned goods were still legible. The Bay Ice has been deemed satisfactory for the landing of aircraft and the word was passed to New Zealand. Within 14 hours, two P2Bs and two R5Ds completed a successful flight from Christchurch, becoming the first aircraft to land at Antarctica from an outside land area. During the survey of the base site, the CBs discovered, through light blasting operations, 
that a rock-hard layer of permafrost lay immediately beneath the surface of the base site. Once scraped of its loose surface stuff, the permafrost provided a firm foundation for the construction of the buildings. In addition to erecting permanent panel-type buildings, the CDs evaluated several temporary types. Among these were the Jamesway Hut and the Atwell Hut. In order to support the heavy air operations at McMurdo Sound, a 250,000 gallon storage tank for aviation gasoline was constructed. When the tank was ready, the gasoline was pumped at a steady rate from the tanker Nestelin, four and a half miles distant. Booster pumps, established at fixed intervals, assisted in maintaining pumping pressure. This bulk fuel handling system also served to transfer bulk diesel from the Nespelin to the 100,000 gallon welded steel storage tank at Hut Point. In addition to the two welded steel storage tanks, eight 10,000 gallon rubber tanks were used for mobile gasoline storage. And two YOGs, which had been towed to the Antarctic, moored to the bay ice, held reserve quantities of aviation gas. The next order of business was the location of an ice runway, strong enough to bear the extreme pressures exerted by the landings of the Air Force's huge C-124 Globemasters. The runway site should be located as close as possible to the main fuel supply, and at such position as to take advantage of existing wind direction. After ice thickness was accurately determined by drilling, rough spots were smoothed by pumping thousands of gallons of water over the runway and milling down high spots with the D8 tractor treads. A constant battle was waged against the ever-present snowdrifts, but by October 1956, the runway was ready to fulfill its mission. With continuous air operations firmly established at Little America and McMurdo Sound, enough diesel fuel and food supplies cached to last the wintering over parties two years, the CB's active support role for the first year at Antarctica was completed. The main job that faced the CBs during the second year at Antarctica was the building of five new bases. Each of these stations would supply vital information to the various scientific projects of the IGY program. Late in the year 1956, the Weddell Sea Task Group arrived in Antarctica. Its mission was the establishment of Ellsworth Station on the ice-strewn coast of the Weddell Sea. One of the incidents peculiar to this operation was the method of offloading cargo. The USS Wyandotte, attack transport, was moored to an ice shelf approximately 100 feet thick. This shelf ice, filled with faults and cracks, could not withstand the extreme weights of tractors and stockpiled cargo. This fact was well evidenced by the collapsing of ice under this D4 tractor. Considerable know-how was called for in the warping and snaking of cargo from ship to shore by power from tractor winches and ship's cranes to a position where cargo trains could be formed up safely. The site for Ellsworth Station was situated two miles inland from the offloading point, and the terrain is relatively flat. The primary building structure was the panel-type hut, successfully used during the first phase of Operation Deep Freeze. Within a record time of 15 days, 18 buildings have been constructed, and Ellsworth Station is self-sufficient. In addition to the civilian scientists, a total of 17 Navy men remained at Ellsworth throughout the year to operate and maintain the base. Simultaneously with the establishment of Ellsworth Station on the Weddell Sea, two other bases were undergoing construction. The first of these, the joint United States and New Zealand base at Cape Hallett, posed a problem far different from the one existing on the ice shelf in the Weddell Sea. Due to the mountainous terrain, the only logical point of land that would lend itself to base construction was a sand spit projecting from the Cape. 
However, establishing a beachhead upon this base site was far easier said than done, since the Adelie penguin had previously chosen this spot as a rookery. The penguin, not possessing a natural fear of man, was a very difficult enemy to displace. The half-grown young and the protesting adults were herded to areas outside the proposed base, and a barrier was erected to prevent their return. However, the penguins were not the only problem faced at Cape Hallett. The attack cargo ship, the USS Arnib, was unable to offload on the bay ice due to the weakness of the ice at the edges. Consequently, an amphibious operation commenced. The icebreaker North Wind cut a channel through the ice until progress was stopped at the firmer Shorefast ice. CDs blasted away the remaining ice and with bulldozers carved out offloading ramps on the shoreline. LCMs were used to ferry the cargo from the Arneb to the base site, thereby making it unnecessary for the large AK to risk mooring to ice or to hazard an approach to the uncharted landfall. A total of nine days were expended in the actual construction of the Cape Hallett Station including the installation of communications equipment and power supply. Construction of Wilkes Station in the Vincennes Bay area immediately followed the establishment of Cape Hallett. Many of the problems in landing cargo at the Wilkes Station site paralleled those faced at Hallett. A landing ramp was carved in proximity to the offloading point. The icebreaker glacier was used to clear away the ice between the offloading ramp and the cargo ship. UDT teams blasted loose the heavier ice formations. With the channel cleared from the Arnev to the offloading ramp, LCMs and pontoon barges ferried the cargo continuously to the shore. The support of a station at the geographic South Pole required a joint Navy Air Force operation. The Navy's R4Ds, specially mounted on skis, fly in the construction and base personnel along with their basic necessities. The bulk of the 500 tons of material needed to construct and supply the base was dropped from C-124 planes of the Air Force's 52nd Troop Carrier Squadron. The fifth and last base to be constructed during Deep Freeze II was Bird Station. Its site lay 647 miles from Little America, and supplies for this base were sledged in overland by tractor train. The first tractor train departed from Little America on 6 December 1956. The train consisted of one weasel for operational control and six D-8 tractors each towing two 20-ton bobsleds. Three weeks later, with the prefabricated structures withstanding the sub-zero blasts, darkness set in. The wintering over parties had their jobs, operate and repair. The colors now flew over seven stations in the Antarctic. In their mission to bring base construction to this frozen wasteland, the CBs had overcome the most adverse elements of nature. Surveyors and builders laying out a camp on rock-hard permafrost. Electricians and utility men plying their trade in spite of gale force winds. Construction drivers moving tons of ice over unfamiliar terrain, cutting roads and trails out of desolation and the construction mechanics who have the job of keeping the equipment moving regardless of the weather. Demonstrating once again their can-do spirit, the CBs have added another frontier to their long list of conquests in building the Navy's bases in all parts of the world.